welcome to Control Systems Engineering. So this uh, playlist is going to basically start with the textbook that I've been using. I guess I should pull up the textbook that I'm using. So this is the, let me see if I can, this is the textbook that I'm using. And uh, this whole slide is basically all of chapter one and then a little bit of chapter two. And I'll do a couple more videos on chapter two because it's a lot longer and I have a lot more systems in there. But chapter one is basically overview of control systems engineering. So the title of this video is overview of control systems engineering. So when you think of control systems engineering, there's a couple different things. One, there's engineering in there. So you have to design something, you have to build something. And then there is the control system. And control system has two words in it. So you've got control, which is basically telling something what to do. You have control over it. And then a system, which is you are developing a, a, a set of actions to uh, have something do something, and it's the whole system is what you are controlling. You're controlling sort of a whole, a whole system here. And that, sub, that system might have subsystems in it, and it might have extra modules in it, and things like that. And so uh, the example that I like to do is basically the one that I feel everybody has experience in. You might be in a country where you don't drive a car, but at least here in the United States, pretty much everybody drives a car here. And so, I guess unless you're in a big city and take mass transit. But if you drive a car, you are uh, pretty well versed with the cruise control system on a car. This has been around for as long as I've been driving at least. And so, who knows when it was originally invented, but it's a very, very simple thing. You, uh, you know, hold the gas pedal down to a certain speed, you hit the cruise control button, you take your foot off the pedal, and voila, your car stays at the exact same speed. The system in this case is the entire car. The controller is trying to control the vehicle to drive at a specific speed. And then the engineering, you, the user, didn't have to do it. You are the user out here. You set the speed, that's all you do. You set the speed, you walk away because the engineer developed the controller in here that actually makes the car do what it wants to do. Now, there are two green dotted boxes here, okay? This smaller green dotted box is called open loop. And open loop basically means you are driving the car. The control system is not driving the car. You, the user, are driving the car. And the way you drive a car, if you only assume the car can go forward and backwards, is by applying throttle. And so this symbol here is delta T. So that is your control input. You, uh, I guess you can't see my foot, but I'm applying throttle uh, with the gas pedal. And that is how I interact with the vehicle, if it was only moving forward and backwards. And so that is open loop, because the uh, I dictate, the I, the user, dictate how fast the car goes. The output of this open loop system is V, the velocity. Now, I don't actually know what this velocity is, which is why below it I have truth. Truth basically means if there was some, you know, omniscient uh, being that knew exactly what the velocity was, that's what that V would be. Unfortunately, we don't know what that V is, and so we need some sort of sensor block and by the way, all of these letters here, N, H, C, A, G, these are pretty, these are, these are like standard nomenclature for uh, control block diagrams. So this entire thing here is called a control block diagram. Okay, you're gonna see this uh, basically for, if you're taking control systems engineering as a class, you're gonna see this for the rest of the semester. If you're just watching this uh, playlist series, then you're gonna see it for the rest of the videos. So this is a control block diagram and all of these letters are standard nomenclature. And so H is typically used for the sensor. And so again, you don't know what truth is, but you can measure it with the speedometer in your car. And the speedometer in your car is measuring either the transmission rate or the wheel rate or some sort of, you know, angular velocity of some rotary thing that converts that to a translational velocity. That is going to get outputted as V hat. This is your measured signal. Now this measured signal might have noise in it, might have bias, scale factor, it could be the raw voltage. 
If it's the raw voltage, then you need to convert it to a, to a speed using some calibration coefficients and things like that. However you want to do it, you're going to have some sort of navigation block, which the navigation block might have some sort of common filter on it, a bubble filter, a scented filter, an extended state common filter. It could have a complementary filter, or it could just use a moving average filter where you just average the signal. Who knows? The point is, is that there is some sort of estimation block, some sort of navigation, which gives you V tilde, which is the estimate of your velocity. Every time you look down at your speedometer, that is an estimate of your speed. It's not your actual speed, it's an estimate. If you've ever been pulled over by a police officer when they uh, shoot their Doppler radar gun at you, that speed has error bars. If they ever issue you a ticket, it'll typically say when the last time the uh, radar gun was calibrated, and it'll also say what the error bar is on. I think. I, it's been a long time since I've been pulled over, but I, I'm pretty sure it says the last time that the radar gun has been calibrated, because that will dictate how good the sensor is. Now, assuming this sensor is good, if you are driving the car and you're trying to drive at a specific speed, what are you going to do? Well, if the speed from the speedometer is too slow, you're going to apply more throttle, speed up. If it's too fast, you're going to back off the throttle, maybe even hit the brakes and slow down. In this case, I want this to all happen automatically because I want a controller to control the system so I can take my foot off the gas pedal. If I'm driving a Tesla, I may even want to take my hands off the wheel, right? And so when I put the gas pedal at a certain point and hit that cruise control button, I interact with this user input and that may or may not go through some command generation block. If you make this problem super simple, your command generation block is just gonna be one identity and it's not gonna do anything. So then basically you get into your velocity command. So this is like a velocity of the user, that's the user input that the, that the, uh, the user puts in and there may or may not be some sort of uh, difference between these two, where this is the actual command sent to the controller. This here is a summing block, and this basically says take the velocity command and subtract it. If you see there's a plus and minus here, do V command minus V tilde, and that becomes your error. Your error, the goal is to drive your error to zero. I want the estimate of my velocity to go to my velocity command. Ideally, I'd like my actual velocity to go to V command, but because I have to interact with the world via observation, the only thing I can really guarantee is that V command and V tilde go to zero. So either get a really, really good sensor or just accept the fact that you're going to have a little bit of error. Okay? That error signal is going to go into this controller, and that controller is going to operate on it in some way. It's going to say, like, okay, my error is big, I'm going to speed up, my error is negative, I'm going to slow down so on and so forth. The entire semester is basically on designing that controller. And you might think that this is super easy and you're like, no big deal, just, you know, if you're too slow, speed up, if you're too fast, slow down. But not all systems are easy. Rockets aren't as simple as cars. You might have a train, you might have a temperature, you might have the oven uh, that needs to heat up to a certain level. There's so many different controllers out there and they all are dependent on the plant. So the controller is going to essentially take you out of the equation. You are no longer applying throttle to the vehicle. The controller is applying throttle to the actuator. And in this case, the actuator for a car is the engine. So the throttle is going to the butterfly valve, or if it's modern cars, it's going to some sort of probably internal engine controller, you know, more oxygen in, more boom, more, more force. Right? The engine is applying torque to the shaft that's going to your tires that's actually applying thrust to your vehicle. And so this force gets applied to your plant. And the plant is a general term for the uh, system that you are interacting with. This is the entire control system. And then your plant is a subsystem of that. Output of G then is V. Okay? So that goes into every single block and name and signal in this entire control block diagram. Now, as I said at the beginning, this little inner dotted line is called the open loop system. And the reason why it's called open loop is because if you notice here, this red line is a feedback loop. If you see, there's sort of a flow with a feedback loop. So this whole thing is a loop. If you cut this out and you only look at this, it's open loop because there is no loop. 
So you can imagine if I draw a dotted line around this entire thing now, that is called the closed loop system. And what we try and do in control systems engineering is take this very, very complicated system and convert it to a system that looks like this, where, oop, that is a typo there. You, the user, right, interact with this closed loop system, and the output is V, velocity, okay? That is how I want to get into my car and drive. I don't want to sit here and think about my speedometer and my estimator and my engine. All I want to do is drive to a certain speed, hit a button, and then get to a speed. This is what the control system, is, system engineer is trying to do for the end user, okay? Now, a little bit more about these C, A, G, N, H, and F. These are called transfer functions, and we'll learn a little bit more about these in chapter two or three. I forget which one. Transfer functions basically tell you output over input. I put it over here, output over input. So for OL, the open loop, the output of the open loop system is V, and then in this case, I made, I made T the input, but I could make delta T the input, where the input is the throttle from the gas pedal, and the output is V, and the relationship between my velocity of my car and uh, throttle input from my gas pedal is equal to G. That ratio is equal to G, this transfer function. When I close the loop, so when I close this whole thing down and bring it down to one closed loop transfer function, now my input is not my throttle. I'm not interacting with throttle anymore. I am inputting a velocity. I am telling the car to go to a certain velocity, and all of these circuits and whistles are, 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 are running through, and my output is still V. But now the ratio between those two is G closed loop, GCL. But the form is the same. Output over input gives me my transfer function. Okay? All of that is basically chapter one. If you read the book in chapter one, it goes through some history of uh, you know, how certain people tried to make passive control systems using uh, spinning tires and things like that. You can read that at your leisure if you have a textbook. I personally don't think it's important to go over that, at least in, 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 at least in a classroom setting. That history, I think, is something that you can easily go read on Wikipedia or wherever you want to or in the textbook, like I said. What I want to do is go ahead and jump into uh, a little bit of chapter two and talk a little bit more about this transfer function, okay? How would I get this transfer function here? If I actually want to put some sort of dynamics to G, how would I do that? Well, what I need to do is I need to make a model of my car and first make a free body diagram, and then second, use Newton's second law to create a relationship between my throttle input and V. So if I'm gonna make a simple free body diagram, I'm gonna make something super simple. I'm gonna say it's translating left and right. The position along this axis is X. I have some, remember, I have some force. I'm gonna call it T for thrust. And then I've got some drag term, negative CV. Okay, so C is some drag coefficient, and then V is my velocity. Technically, drag on a car is quadratic, it's V squared. Technically, there's friction, there's also losses in the engine. There's so many different things that you can include in here, but let's just make it as simple as possible. And this is my model of my car, okay? Is it accurate? No. Is it simple? Yes. All right, so then we go into Newton's second law. So Newton's second law says the sum of all the forces on the system is equal to mass times acceleration. Well, acceleration in this case can be x double dot, the second derivative of acceleration, or I could make it v dot, which is the first derivative of velocity. And since my output is v, I'm going to use this second equation because I want v to be in my equation. I don't want a, I don't want x, I want v. And derivatives are fine for transfer functions. Transfer functions can handle derivatives, no problem. If we look at the left-hand side, the sum of the forces is going to be thrust positive and then negative cv. I'm going to have a negative drag term. I draw arrows in the direction of uh, positive and negative, and then I also write the sign here. Um, some people get confused and say like, oh, well that's drawn negative and that's negative, so a negative and negative is a positive. I don't draw it like that. You pick however you want to do it. I'm saying the drag is negative, so it applies a negative force to the car. It slows you down, all right? 
If you put all this together, you're going to get T minus CV is MV dot. And if you rearrange this equation, you're going to get V dot plus C over MV. I divided the whole system by M. There is a typo. It's not a typo. It's a, I don't know what you call it. Anyway, you divide the whole thing by M, and you're going to get V dot plus C over MV equals T over MV. This equation here is an equation of V and T. And how I had it before, if you did V divided by T, you could use this to, to derive a transfer function. Now, to actually get the transfer function G, you need to learn Laplace transforms, and I don't want to do that in this video. So I just kind of wanted to give you a, a, like a quick little foray on how you could do that. And then keep in mind that this actuator, output over input, T divided by delta T is equal to A, so T is equal to A times delta T, and so I could easily plug that into this equation, and then I would have an equation that relates velocity to my throttle input, okay? And again, that is an overview of control system dynamics uh, with, a, with a standard feedback loop here, and in, the, in subsequent videos from here on out, we're gonna do uh, more modeling. Th this is all of chapter one, basically, uh, without all of the history. Chapter two is going to be how do we create models that to represent our transfer function G, and then how do we use Laplace transforms to get us uh, transfer functions in the Laplace domain. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one.